I want to start by saying that, um, as she mentioned, the titles of the first two books I have published. Um, the third one, which is the more recent one, is really the third of a trilogy. And I think it will be the last of my writing history. But uh, I will not bother you in speaking about what happened before the second Majlis. I only mentioned that the first Majlis also was short-lived and it was a first attempt to implement or experiment with the um, democratic, shall I say, or parliamentarian governance. It came to an end because of the Anglo-Russian intervention. There was a coup, the Majlis was bombarded, the reactions of the Shah became very brutal, and there was a fierce resistance practically all over the country, but specifically in the north, in Gilan and in Azerbaijan. What complicated the situation, and in many ways, what justified Anglo-Russian deed was the fact that since 1907, Iran was divided into two different spheres of uh, influence. One in the north, which was the largest part actually, uh, because it included the northeast, was declared a Russian zone. And in the south, southeast, and also it included the Gulf region um, for the British zone. That complicated the first Majlis action and of course precipitated the first coup in 1908. And of course it led to the resistance. The resistance was bloody and it included different ideological groups involved. I don't want to go into this because it's very complex, but let me say that it was multi-ideological. There were the socialists, there were the moderate liberals, there were the Armenians, there were the Armenians of Iran or the Armenians coming from the Caucasus. They played a great deal in the resistance in the North. And also some of them played a very important role for the second Majlis in establishing the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party started as a socialist party, but very quickly, once the resistance won the fight, and once Tehran was um, also in a battle, both short-lived battle, was conquered by the so-called Mujahideen, which was this sort of international type of groups, different militias involved in conquering Tehran and forcing the Shah to, the reactionary Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, to uh, resign. And the constitution was restored. Now that laid down really the problems that the Majlis began to confront. One was the various ethnic groups involved in the resistance. It involved also with their different uh, ideologies, their different uh, programs, and it also included the moderates, uh, intellectuals mostly, or civil servants, the intelligentsia as we know, we use usually the word like this, who were truly interested in reforming the country, reforming that is modernizing the country and using Western Europe as a model. Western Europe as a model was used in order to um, seek guidance and source of inspiration for the construction of what they called Iran and No, the new Iran. Now the class composition of these various people was that the Mujahideen were essentially people of very modest background and included originally in the newly installed Democrat party were people like Hassan Tarizadeh, the Tabrizi uh, politician who had played a great role in the first Majlis and went into exile after the coup in 1908, lived in England, got to know especially 
Professor Edward G. Brown. Uh, Edward G. Brown of Cambridge University took him under his mentor, he was his mentor, and taught him all about constitutionalism and how to run effectively a constitutional government and a parliamentary government. But he was a man, this professor, who was cool, who called from the beginning for moderation. So you have a group and people like Theresa Day, influenced by the moderate Professor Brown and other colleagues in the revolution who also were moderate. And on the other hand, you have the more radical people, the Mujahideen and their leaders who played an important role in the resistance. After the success of the conquest of Tehran and the restoration of the constitution, the clash between these various groups really exploded. And Tari Zadeh, because he was from, from the very beginning enjoying the support of the British embassy, especially the ambassador in Tehran, and of course getting his uh, order from the foreign office in London, he got Tari Zadeh emerged very quickly to the top of the leadership of the Majlis. He was associated with the Democrats, but as soon as he assumed power, and a power that was in those days supported by various groups, he, how would I say, kept his distance from the socialists. And these socialists were both Iranian, Azerbaijanis, or elsewhere from Iran, and essentially the Armenians. The Armenians played a big role in the constitutional revolution, especially in the beginning, in the resistance, in helping uh, setting up the program for the Democrat Party. But since the Democrat Party began to think that Iran was not ready for socialist revolution, it is better to have, at least in the beginning, a bourgeois revolution. Now, the more radical Armenians dissented. And so there was a split among the Armenians themselves. Those who went along with Tari Zadeh, saying the first step is a bourgeois revolution, reforms, and then the socialist revolution will come afterward. Those who dissented, and of course the dissent was not just ideological between the various Armenians and the various Iranians, but it was also personal, and who supported whom. So that complicated the situation in the establishment of the first, second Majlis. On the other hand, you have people who I would call turncoats, those who were, you know, partisan of the old Shah, reactionary Shah, and then decided that now the revolutionaries have won, so therefore they're going to join them too. And a lot of these people came from of course, the old aristocracy, the elite in government, um, they played a role, but some of them were genuine constitutionalists. And here I must mention um, Sani El Dole. He was a member of a well-established, wealthy and a very powerful, influential family. Uh, he and his brother, Mohbed al-Seltane, had uh, were sent to Berlin to study when they were young in school. And um, they lived with a Siemens family. The Siemens family is a very important, still until now, um, industrial and banking uh, family. And they took these two brothers under their wing and helped them to develop. And this important relation with the German family played an important role once the Second Majlis was set. Because from the beginning, you begin to have three important politicians who played a role in the revolution, in the Second Majlis. One, you have the two brothers who were declared immediately, especially by the Russians, but also by the English as German clients. Then you have the Bakhtiari Ilkhan, Sedar Asad, who was considered a client of or a protege of the British. And you have the Sepahdar, who was from Gilan, a powerful family, and was encouraged to participate in the revolution once they were successful and become one of the leaders. 
and he became successively president, um, um, uh, uh, prime minister or, or, or um, minister of defense. Uh, he, this position was practically um, exchanged between Sadoras at um, um, Bakhtari and, and the Sepahdar. The Sepahdar was considered a Russian. And that, by the way, has been in the, in the um, Iranian sources. Um, very few references are made to this patronage, British or Russian or German, with the important leaders of the Second Majlis period. Um, but if you study the archives, especially the Russian and the British and the French archives, there is plenty of um, evidence but indeed, the Sepahdar, who is considered in the traditional uh, chronology, the traditional uh, study of the revolution, uh, as really a genuine patriotic constitutionalist leader. He was, in fact, under the thumb of the Russians. And he played a role, eventually, with the destruction of the Second Majlis. Bakhtari was much more clever. Bakhtari was um, able to turn or exchange positions. At times he was, you know, with the Democrat Party. At times he were with the more conservative people. Um, he knew how to play his cards very well, and he survived. But so did the Subhadar, because both were indeed supported. Now, let's speak a little bit about this Anglo-Russian intervention. As I said, in 1907, you had the uh, agreement signed officially between the British and the Russians. Um, it was for a long time uh, um, seen as an attempt, this, this agreement, peaceful agreement between the Russians and the British to divide their various spheres of zone, as, uh, zones of influence in order to stop conflicts. Uh, and it was accepted, but it was considered as a means to prevent the Germans. You know, that was shortly after the reunification of Germany and the rise to power of Imperial Germany. And Germany was also rising as an economic power. And Germany, having the economic power, was interested in developing trade with an investment in Iran, something that because of the agreement between the Russians and the French and the, the, the Russians and, um, and the British, there was no room for the Germans. They were not allowed, the Germans were not allowed. And so the whole history of the Second Majlis is also a history of the, um, the British and the Russians fighting and obstructing any attempt by the Germans to get involved anyway in Iranian economics or politics. And that of course determined the situation which provided the background, the context for the very important reforms that the Majlis had tried to, not only to enact because they were enacted, but also to implement. Considering part of this also, the influence of the British and the, and the Russians, Iran was bankrupt. It had no money to implement any of its reforms or even to function normally. It, the treasury was empty. And so they needed loans. The British and the Russians considered themselves the only source of loans for the Iranian government. And they would not allow, not only they would not allow the Germans to, to give uh, um, better conditions for a new loan to the Iranians, and uh, who really sought, that sought, the Iranians sought again and again throughout the Second Majlis, sources of finances independent of the two Russian powers so much involved in Iranian politics but they were obstructed. They could not do it uh, for various reasons. I will not go into that. But again, this issue of negotiating the loan played or sort of undermined the effort of the constitutionalists in the Majlis to carry on their reforms. Now, add to this, the Iranians 
decided, and the British also were for it in the beginning, to have a financial expert, a Western I, from Europeans. The Russians and the British wanted a European financial expert to come with, a, with the um, approval of a second majlis to have the Iranian government to um, um, reform the financial situation. The Iranians eventually, and I will not give you the details now, the Iranians eventually decided they wanted to have an America. And here have a very important role of Morgan Schuster, an American uh, expert of finances who had already worked for in the Philippines for restoring their finances. And he was at the end uh, asked to withdraw from the Philippines by Washington because he felt he, the Washington government decided that he was too much um, uh, reforming and not to the liking of Washington. But then he was invited by the Americans, by the Iranians to come as, when he came to Iran, he asked for complete authority in financial affairs. The Madlis unanimously granted him absolute authority to reform the finances of the country. The, the Bakhtiaris and even Britain conceded that that was needed. And so in the beginning, when he came, he was given a lot of freedom and all doors were open and the various civil servants were, were instructed to follow the instructions of Morgan Schuster and to do whatever he wants them to do. But there were, of course, a lot of people who were not happy. And that was the old elite because the tax system was also, that was the first job that Schuster tried to do, the tax system. There was a lot of corruption. This is inherited from the old system. And if you don't, um, <laughs> get rid of corruption in just uh, a few months or a few weeks even. Um, so there was a lot, a lot of hidden resistance from the moment Schuster decided to reform the tax system. The old elite who had supported him in the beginning turned against him and tried to obstruct his reforms. Um, then of course you have the Russians who very quickly realized that Schuster is going to be, whatever reforms he establishes, is going to be very detrimental to their own Russian interest in the country. And the British also were be beginning to be, in, to be very worried because the old elite and Britain preferred to, to work with the old elite under their instruction to become constitutionalist and reform, but not to the extent that the reforms would mean really a complete change of the system. The system, the old system was working very well for the British and the Russians. So what happened is that though he had acquired a very quick unanimous um, um, approval by everybody concerned in the second majlis, in the beginning of the second majlis, he very quickly lost their support. The reason why, first of all, by nature and character, he is described as a man who had very strong moral principles and all his reforms and all the role he played first in the Philippines and then in Iran were really guided by these moral principles. Some of his uh, detractors uh, believed that he was too intransigent. And in many of the archives of the British and of the French, he's described as a, an elephant in the middle of the room, that he was in fact destroying more than he was actually succeeding in constructing. But definitely the reason was, especially Russia, was very, very much against his reforms. And, but eventually the British. The British, why? Because the British went along with the Russian opposition because they were, 
very uh, worried about the, 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 the end of the agreement, the 1907 agreement. The 1907 agreement was extremely important for the government in foreign office in London in those days. There were people who were against it from the very beginning, but Lord Grey, who was a foreign minister at that time, and the people he managed to have around him were absolutely adamant in safeguarding all the terms of the 1907 agreement. And that meant accepting anything, any objection on the part of Russia with what is happening in Iran. And this is something that the Iranians very quickly saw, but Morgan Schuster also saw. And he felt that England had nothing to win out of this, but just playing the game according to the wishes of Russia. France also played a role, but Germany also played a role. Now Germany, let me talk about Germany first. Germany was indeed expanding into the Middle East, first in the Ottoman Empire and then in the Arab world. Um, the emperor of, of um, Germany had had a first trip to the Ottoman Empire and to the North African countries. And he sort of developed a strong attachment to Islam, Muslims and the Middle East. And he encouraged the German businessmen to develop and to penetrate as much as possible economically the Middle East, including Iran. Now, in many of the archives that I am familiar with, German archives, Germany in its correspondence with the Russians and the British and the French insisted that they were not interested in any way in damaging the terms of the Anglo-Russian agreement. What they wanted is the right to also get involved in the economic development of Iran. It had no political um, um, agenda at all, but of course they did not believe him. And the thing is also France was involved in that. France, remember, had lost a war in 1970. Uh, 1870 against the Germans. And there was a strong spirit of revanchisme, you know, seeking revenge and, and restore um, the honor and um, the provinces with, that, that Germany had conquered away from France, like, like uh, Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, so they were preparing for war against, against Germany. And they were interested in having an alliance with the Russians and the British. And for them, it was absolutely important that the agreement of 1907 stays alive and is not destroyed for fear of Germany. Why was France fearing Germany? Because definitely there were Iranians and specifically the two brothers, Sani El Dole, the creature of Germany, which he wasn't. He was just seeking advice, inspiration, um, and contact with the various uh, financial and industrial um, companies in Germany. And they spoke fluent German and they even established a German school in Tehran. Um, but France really did not want that and called, called Sané Il Dole again and again, the creature of Germany. Um, and it was detrimental to the Anglo-Russian um, Entente, you know, agreement and detrimental to, of course, to, uh, to France and French interests. And there were many, apart from these two brothers, there were many um, Iranians who were seeking loans elsewhere besides Germ um, Britain or uh, Russia. And they were interested in really, really having an independent source of and the Germans offered that. And that of course was obstructed as I told you. And there were international European financial uh, companies who were ready to give, uh, to give loans. Um, but of course they would need to have uh, um, terms that would ensure the, uh, uh, the um, compensations. And, and that is something that the British and the Russians, both of them, definitely were opposed and they did their utmost and they succeeded 
in sabotaging any attempt of a European uh, source of loan for the countries. As I said, we don't know, we, not much has been written of the role of France in that period, but it was an important role. The French ambassador who was truly uh, against the constitutionalist um, uh, had, was instructed again and again to maintain the good relations between the Russians and the British and to not to go along with um, um, Iranians who were seeking elsewhere and especially with Germany. Now, what is important is that um, the 1907 agreement um, was considered for a long, long time by historians as um, caused by the need of the British to um, check the advance and the penetration of Germany, economic penetration of Germany in the Middle East and especially in Iran. A more recent book, and I think it was published in 2010 by a British um, historian, I think he's in uh, Oxford or Cambridge University, Christopher Clark, his book, The Sleepwalkers, I recommend everybody to read it to understand the great game and all the situation on the eve of World War I. But for my interest, he really proved with a lot of evidence that the 1907 agreement was truly motivated, not by the threat of Germany, by the need of London, the British government to appease Russia. It was fear of Russia because Russia was indeed the greatest competitor in Iran for the British. And that of course, in my own, in my own even before I read this book, I had reached that conclusion. But in fact, what the British were doing through that agreement was to check and contain the ambition of the Russians rather than the threat of Germany. They could handle the, they could handle the, um, uh, the threat of Germany and they did, in fact, they did. Um, so here is, you have the international situation and here you have the various groups involved and you have the various countries who have their own creatures, quote unquote, well, that's a too, too pejorative a term, but they're, they're proxies, so they're supporters. Um, but we have to now speak about the actual Iranian constitutional leaders of the second majlis. As I said, Tarizadeh was the most important one. And as long as he won the support of the British, and he was not yet a great threat to the Russians, he managed to remain in power. Now, the other thing is that, are, of course, um, Sani Ildole, who was constantly in one government after the other in two years of the tenure of the second majlis, and you have others as well. Um, but Sani Ildole was indeed, well, without being really a creature of the Germans, but was indeed interested in checking the power of the British and the Russians in Iran by replacing it with the, um, the Germans and afterward the Americans. Um, so there was a sense of um, more and more Iranians among the intelligentsia reaching out to the German imperial government. And as the encroachment of the Russians and the British in Iranian internal affairs increased, they insisted on going to Germany and some letters written to the emperor literally begged the German emperor to get involved in Iran, to help the Iranians who wanted to really shake off the, the yoke of the British and the Russians in internal affairs. Um, one thing that the German sources do show without any, any doubt is that indeed the Germans were willing to help the Iranian constitutionalist financially and in investing in the country, but they were not at all interested in getting involved in revoking 
the uh, agreement of 1907. So you have this funny situation where really the Iranians were the losers all the way. This is the age of the, or really the um, lasting um, breath of the, what is called the great, um, the great game in Asia. Um, and on the eve of World War, uh, World War I. Um, now, the Majlis from the beginning was controlled by Tari Zadeh. But as I said, the moment Tari Zadeh acquired power and had the support to push for his reforms in the Majlis, he started distancing himself from the extreme right wing, um, extreme um, um, leftist wing, the radical uh, wing of the Democrat party to which he belonged. And he changed even the name of the party. It was no longer Social Democratic Party of Iran, but it was just the Democrat Party of Iran. They were liberals. They were far reaching in their attempt to reform the various institutions, secularizing the public institutions through enacting reforms in the Majlis. And they were successful. This is, I have to insist, that the reforms, and most of them were secularizing reforms, were successful because no matter what was the ethnic or the professional um, identity of the deputies in the majlis, they were all and often in the debate unanimously voted for far reaching secularizing reforms. I have to insist on that. The constitution was a secular constitution. It did not deny uh, the right of the ulama to play a role in religious affairs, but they curtailed severely, severely curtailed the um, ulama um, function in public affairs, in political affairs and in public affairs the various public institutions, like the education was, was very important. And that was one of the most uh, important success of the second majlis, uh, reforming the um, uh, educational system entirely, entirely, including bringing the WEFT, the WEFT um, um, orders, um, which are really um, endowments, charity endowments uh, by rich people. And traditionally it was given um, entrusted to a member of the high class of the ulama. But the, um, the majlis allowed this to happen, but insisted that the whole WEFT system had to come under the Ministry of Education jurisdiction. And that was very important. And that, of course, antagonized many people. Um, so enters Mr. 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 Schuster and Mr. Schuster worked very closely with the Democrats. He despised the old elite and he does not mince his word in his writings about what he thought of the old elite. They were corrupt, they were incompetent, they were seeking only their selfish interest, they were not really constitutionalists. Um, they were not interested in reforming the country, standing, helping the new Iran to stand on its own two feet. And he was there, Schuster was there to curtail that power through the tax system and push for strong uh, reforms. He enjoyed till the very end, till the very end, he enjoyed the support of the Democrats. And when I wanted the situation and, and the story is very complicated, but I would just, because I talk too much. What happened is that eventually what was unanimous effort to reform the country, especially enacting secularizing reforms began to um, be divided. And various people, not only members of the ulama who were deputies in the second majlis, but also lay, lay deputies incited by various people behind the scene, uh, Russian, British, or the elite that was antagonized, began to attack Theresa Day, attack the Democrats, and spread the, the image of the Democrats and what is happening in the country as a radical socialist revolution, which it was not. Um, I mean, I've read the minutes of the second majlis from page one to 
God knows how many thousand pages. And there was not a single evidence that the Majlis deputies were trying in any way to enact a law that was considered socialist. Even the very important, which many of them wished, but they could not succeed in doing it, to, to put a clause that would bring a separation of the mosque and the state, the separation of religion from politics. They were not successful. They were too wise, those few who wanted it, they were too wise not to do it because they knew it wasn't going to win any, any vote at all. So really, um, the secular, uh, what I call secular constitution and the reforms were not like, the, let's say, the secular constitution of the United States or of France, which sees a separation of these two. Um, definitely, what was put into enshrined, really, in the constitution that was um, promulgated in 1907 with the supplement, it states that Shi'i Islam is the state religion. And it remains so, and it remains till the end. Um, but nonetheless, there were the opponents of Schuster. There were the opponents of, uh, um, that's before, uh, later, but before that, opponents of Theresa De, who began to fuel malicious rumors in Najaf. And there were also ulama in Iran, it proper, who were opposed to Dariza Day and opposed to some of his, what they call radical reforms. So Najaf eventually promulgated a decree cause, calling for the political demise of Dariza Day. Dariza Day was forced to, to leave and eventually went into exile, his second exile. The members of the uh, deputies who were there defended him, but at the same time, at the same time, they began to be a bit more moderate in talking about Islam and referring to Islam. Um, and so very quickly, you have a, a loss of unity before among them. And that loss of unity was fueled by the people who were for one reason or another were antagonized. And that's what happened um, in December 1911. Uh, Bakhtiari, who again changed, sh shift his position um, with the Bakhtiari troops, um, besieged the Majlis and the deputies inside and forced it to close. And it was closed and it was not to be uh, reopened till much later. And that was, uh, I don't have time to speak about my reforms, but um, I, would, I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bayad. We have lots of questions and comments coming in for you, so I'm gonna get right to them. One viewer writes, recent scholars have written about the hitherto overlooked role of women in the constitutional revolution. Can you talk about their role? Very good questions. Yes, 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 yes. Um, um, it's a vast subject, you know, then, then I have only maximum 40 minutes, I took 40 minutes. Uh, yes, uh, they played a role, there is no doubt about that. And you know, what is the best source for the role of the women in this second majlis? It was Morgan Schuster. Morgan Schuster was supported by women. I won't call revolutionary women, but women who fought for my right, the first majlis, refused to give them the right to vote. And they were upset also because the second majlis refused to give them the right to vote. The electoral system absolutely keeps them out of this right. Um, but Morgan Schuster was supported by these women and some of them were really very courageous women. A lot of them were upper class, wives or daughters of the elite members of the, uh, of the majlis actually. And he, in, in a very interesting um, paragraph, he speaks about them as the most modern, the most um, far reaching, the most courageous women in the world that he knows of. Remember, that was the time of the suffragettes movement in, especially in England and in the United States. 
So he had some comparison. Now, was he right to declare them the most courageous women in the world? I don't know, but he was writing this because they supported him and they often clandestinely provided him with uh, coming at night, you know, in Fognitu, uh, giving him uh, various documents which they took from their um, husband or their, or their sons to prove that he was right in his denunciation of that person corruption. Um, so yes, they played a role. They participate in, in, in manifestations. They, um, they establish their own Anjumans. In the first Majlis where Anjuman, women's Anjuman was closer to the men's Anjuman, Anjuman the, uh, the various uh, societies, but they formed their own independent women and they played a role and they tried to push, but unfortunately in the new reforms, they did not get much. Um, at one point, um, one deputy, of course, all the deputies were men, uh, raised the issue that one woman of his acquaintance um, wanted the, um, the majlis to enact a law that allows women in schools to study matters, uh, biology, physics, um, mathematics, like the men. Um, in, you know, in the reform schools curriculum, and it created an uproar in the majlis. They are not equipped for that. They are, they don't have the brain. They were not created for the brain, you know, the usual traditional anti-women. Anti and it was immediately dismissed and it wasn't even debated. The same thing with the right to vote, that too was, was, was dismissed. And um, the chair of a committee for the electoral laws insisted that yes, he would be in favor of giving the right to vote to women, but he said, this is not the time. So they were defeated. They really were defeated. Well, they participated a great deal. In one of my earliest articles, which was published, God knows when, in, in, the, in the 70s, 78, I think, I, I do have an article about this, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question is, what, if any, role did the Babi and Baha'is play in the revolution or resistance? Okay, I have been described, vilified <laughs> as a Baha'i and as Ali, uh, whatever, whatever, because in my first book, Mysticism and Descent, I have a whole chapter, not about Baha'is, I don't know much about Baha'is, but about the predecessor of Baha'ism, which is the um, Babi movement in the, middle of a, um, in the middle of the 19th century. And I give details of how they were truly attempted to reform and curtail the power of the Ayatollahs in, in Iranian affairs. Uh, of course, it was declared, uh, was declared uh, a um, heresy and he was killed. Uh, and then um, his successors were divided. One division became the Baha'is and one division became the Azalis. The Baha'is decided not to get involved in politics. Uh, and the Azalis were involved in, and they played a great role. Well, it is not recognized in the conventional sources of the revolution, but they did play a great role, but not as Azalis, they just, converted their, um, their, their ideas from religious as Ali to, uh, to really secular political constitutional movement. They joined the secular constitutionalist and the ulama who were in favor of the constitutionalist. But very little is written about it. Even Feridun Adamiyat, one of the most important um, uh, historian of the, of the revolution uh, does not mention their background. Thank you. Uh, did Takizadeh overall play a positive role in this period? And did he continue his relations with the British for the rest of his life, especially during his ambassadorship in Germany? Are you talking about Takizadeh? Yes. Oh, Takizadeh really is a very complex guy for the period I'm talking about. Um, he was supported indeed by the British. In fact, during, during the civil war in the North, 
after the coup against the first Majlis. Uh, he, uh, he met uh, in Cambridge, Professor Brown, and um, Professor Brown tried to sort of open doors in governments, government uh, departments. And, um, and in a way, in an in a untold, uh, really untold uh, um, gesture, uh, the um, Lord Grey even supported Theresa Day to go back and establish a reconciliation. Uh, and, and, and he went back to Tabriz um, anonymously and then rallied together various groups to, um, to, rest, to help restore the, the constitution. By the time, by the time Theresa Day was sent back, um, he, um, Lord Grey managed to uh, have the agreement of Russia uh, to um, restore the constitution. Um, and so, that period, and as I said, he became a most important reformer in the Majlis and recognized as the most important leader of the, of the, um, of the Majlis. And his role is very important. And his role even by his detractors, like, like um, the French ambassador who was so anti-constitutionalism and so skeptical about it, cynical. Um, but he said, if there is one real revolutionary leader, it is Theresa Day. But he said, there are ways and means, and that is in the French documents, there are ways and means, the ambassador wrote, to support his demise. So there were various groups involved in hastening his, de his demise, not only internally, but also from abroad. Uh, afterward, yes, um, he went to uh, Berlin and um, frankly, I, I don't want to talk much about it because I have not done original research. Thank you. Critics of the constitutional revolution have referred to it as a British ploy. What evidence is there for this claim? No, no, the British in the beginning supported it for their own end. They wanted to have reforms because the reforms would help them in their in their uh, economic and trade and trade activities in the country uh, they wanted military for instance they wanted a modern military they wanted modern uh, financial uh, rules and laws that will facilitate their own activities in the country but very quickly as i said because they were very anxious to keep the russians uh, support, continue to support the, um, the agreement. And therefore they just gave in to all the demands of the Russians. Uh, whether Theresa Day was a creature or the constitutional revolution was a creature, I do not agree with that. There was, and if you read my first uh, book and my second book, there's plenty of evidence that there was a movement, movement being formed by seeking guidance and seeking um, support. And of course the British gave support, but the support that the English um, and the British ambassador in Tehran gave in the beginning uh, was not totally agreed with by Lord Grey or the group around the uh, group, um, uh, Lord Grey. And so he, he could not really do things as he wanted. But support does not mean that it was a conspiracy of the British. I, my work as a historian absolutely refutes that. Thank you. And what role, if any, did the U.S. play in this period? There is some evidence of Iranian nationalist efforts to bring the U.S. into the process. Of course, this is with Morgan Schuster, definitely. And it was done uh, secretly. There was the British, the American ambassador in Tehran, who really was in contact with the Democrats, and uh, I, whether he's the one who suggested to the constitutionalist uh, to hire an, an American, uh, I don't know. But he played a big role, that ambassador, uh, in in staging this this movement uh, to bring an American um, financial expert and reform. Uh, and, and the Iranians, all, especially the Democrats, but even those who were not politically, politically affiliated with any group, um, were all for it. 
and has uh, facilitated um, um, and requested the, the American government in Washington to grant that right. And they chose um, Morgan Schuster. And um, yes, then Morgan Schuster played a very important role. And as I said, he antagonized all his reforms, antagonized the old elite, but antagonized also some of the, you know, the opportunist members of the government or of the of the um, of the Majlis, um, they were offended by him. Even Sadar Asad Bakhtiari, who in the beginning was all for Schuster, turned against him because he also turned against the corruption of the of the Bakhtiaris. So, as I said, he is, um, and I can say that from my own uh, research, uh, he was a man with very strong, very strong moral principles. Thank you. Having just but that was only the beginning. And by the way, I just want to tell you, that was only the beginning of American involvement because uh, at the end, when the Russians and the British were absolutely upset and demanded, really demanded the resignation of, of Schuster and Schuster will tell them, I don't got, get my instructions. I get my, my, my instruction from the Majlis. If the Majlis ask me to resign, I will but I will not get this instruction from you. And of course he never got it. Um, but eventually um, Washington decided literally to ditch Schuster and assured the British and the Russians, both of them, that they are not going to support him any longer. Thank you. Having just deposed Muhammad Ali Shah, how did the second Majlis redefine the institution of monarchy? Oh, um, it was definitely remained as in the constitution of 1906, 1907, a constitutional monarchy and the Rajars. And here, that's a good question because there were people who were really interested either for really destroying the monarchy full stop or to have another dynasty besides the Rajar dynasty. And here, because Lord Grey had a lot of, of problems um, clashing with deputies in parliament who truly, truly um, um, criticized his policy in Iran. And he was really placated. He was worried that he would lose the support of the parliament. And in order to win, continue to at least not lose his support, he turned to the Russian foreign minister and told him, you've got to really concede something. And one of the concession was the monarchy will not be destroyed, but the Rajars, that is just important, the Rajars, a new one, uh, will remain the, the dynasty. And the, the Russians agreed. And, and more important, Muhammad Ali Shah will never be restored. That's the only concession that Lord Grey got from the Russians, the only one, literally. So ironically, <laughs> the Rajah dynasty survived for a while until 1925, and, uh, and the constitutional monarchy remained until the revolution of 78, 79. That was the concession that Lord Grey had gotten from the Russians. Thank you. We have lots of um, viewers thanking you for your research and for a wonderful talk. There are two more questions I want to ask. One viewer writes, was there a lasting legacy from the second Majlis? Yes, I'm sorry, I don't have the time uh, for this. I mean, the reforms, the, the reforms on the second Majlis, especially the second Majlis, uh, really laid the legal foundation for modern Iran. They could not implemented, they did not have the money, and also because the second majlis was closed. But eventually, all these reforms, practically, the major ones, you know, um, including the idea of a constitution and constitutional monarchy, was pick, picked up by Reza Shah. And that explains why a lot of members of the intelligentsia in Iran in the 1920s and 30s, in the beginning, fully supported Reza Shah, because he was going to implement the reforms that they had worked so hard to enact. The rest is history. 
Thank you. The last question is a bit speculative and forward looking. A viewer writes, understanding that the same forces that resulted in the defeat of the constitutional revolution exist today, is there a chance for a democratic regime in Iran? If so, how? Oh, well, that's very speculative and I don't speculate. Um, I, I, I hope that eventually we will have the restoration of um, parliamentary government. And I think, I don't know about Republican and monarchy that I, I, I don't want even to discuss it. I don't know much what's going on. I, so I prefer not to talk about that. But my hope is that truly the constitution laws and parliamentary government, not just in name as it is now, will, uh, will succeed in restoring some kind of uh, democracy. I hope so. But I cannot predict. There is no way I can predict. <laughs>